Okay, got it. All right, whenever you're ready. Hi, this is. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it always starts out this way. <laughs> I know. Seasons may change. We stay the same. We always stay the same. It's been quite a good year. I'd like to welcome to the Monkeys Pad Bobby Dick of the Sundowners. The Sundowners toured with the Monkeys during the summer of 1967 tour. Bobby's been in the music business since the early 60s. He's from Brooklyn, New York. How are you, uh, Bobby? Welcome well, to the Monkeys Pad. I'm glad you picked like 10, 10:30, 11 o'clock. That's a that's sort of a new musician time, you know. Uh, it's all good. You guys were a very hot show band on the la scene at that time and the monkeys used to come see you at the club called the red velvet isn't that right well you know your stuff uh actually but they weren't monkeys when they came to see us uh they were not monkeys yet they were uh little monkey embryos <laughs> i'm only kidding uh as you know the monkeys became monkeys i think by a in variety magazine there was an open casting call Hollywood and Southern California was where you should be in the 60s. So they were kind of just hanging. And, uh, you know, it's the same story. You have to hang around long enough. Maybe you're a waiter. Maybe you're uh, uh, parking cars. You have to hang on where the action is so that if something happens, you'll be in the middle of it. They came to see us because we played the Red Velvet, which on, on a particularly, oddly enough, on a Monday night, it was the, the place to go. You had to be at the Red Velvet on Monday night because that's where the action was. And uh, it was like a jam session, although we were the house band. Everybody was invited up to sing. We used to back up the Righteous Brothers. Bill Medley and, and Bobby Hatfield would come there. Elvis's Mafia would come there. The Rolling Stone. Everybody that was anybody came into Hollywood and they wanted to go to the club scene. They went to the Red Velvet on Monday night. And uh, and so the answer is when the monkeys finally uh, wound up being picked and recording the TV show and the tour was planned, they went back to their roots and they said, you know what? We love that band, the Sundowners. Why don't we ask them? And that's how that program is. Do you remember specifically meeting any of the monkeys before they were monkeys at the club? Do you want to know something? No. Monday night, the Red Velvet was where to be. So why don't you tell me who was in the band and who was the personnel at the time during that period? Well, the Sundowners um, were very fortunate in that uh, we had some very talented musicians. Frankly, I'm a bass player. I was a bass player by default because you go to rehearsal and 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 I'm playing guitar and the guys look at you after the after rehearsal and said, uh, Bobby, uh, maybe you want to play bass. We had two guitar players that were, ex either one could have been a lead guitar player in any band, but we had two of them. So yeah, if you were to say Dominic Demiri or Donnie Burton was the lead guitar player, yes, but Ed Placidy was also, yeah. We used to do Memphis by Lonnie Mack, and if you know, you listen to Memphis by Lonnie Mack, that's a pretty good instrumental to begin with. We played, not only did Memphis by Lonnie Mack, we did it in two-part harmony because both guitar players could play it. I mean, it was it was it was amazing. The other thing is, so we had Dominic Demiri on lead guitar, Eddie uh, Eddie Placidy on second lead guitar, me on bass, uh, Kim Kapley uh, from he was from Turkey was an amazing drummer, about four foot eleven, ninety two pounds, and could kick ass, and uh, Eddie Brick, and Eddie Brick was just a singer, but he uh, played tambourine. The thing about Eddie Brick is he had the perfect falsetto. Uh, and so it was a perfect dynamic musically and, and vocally because all the Sundowners sang and all the Sundowners sang very well. So what was your entree to the summer tour? How did you hook up with Ray Burt and wind up invited to play on the tour? The monkeys, we all we wound up meeting at the hamburger hamlet. And and it's funny because we're dipping French fries in in ketchup at the hamburger hamlet. And either Mike or Davy said, Do you guys want to go on tour? 
<laughs> that sounds like it would have been Davy. <laughs> yeah, that would have been Davy. You know, I, I don't know. I, to tell you that whether it was Mike or Davy, I don't really know. But here are all these agents jockeying because at the time, as you know, as I, I think we uh, we have talked, the monkeys from from uh, for about eight months of maybe um, sixty six into sixty seven, they were almost bigger than the Beatles. In the moment, and when I say the moment, the eight-month moment with the TV show, it won an Emmy Award, Last Train to Clarksville, Daydream to Believe. It had all those top ten hits. So consequently, they were very big. So everybody wanted to go on this tour because it was going to be monumental. So what was your first step to actually being on the tour? Well, you know, it's one of those situations where your guy calls our guy and that kind of a thing, you know, and – that's pretty much how it was handled. There was uh, in contracts involved. Um, uh, Ward Sylvester was involved at Screen Gems. Uh, we had a manager back here that was involved. And not only that, we were in the middle of recording our album, Captain Nemo, at Sunset Sound, right on Sunset Boulevard. So there was a lot of pressure. Plus, we were playing, you know. And when I say recording, you've heard these stories about recording sessions. Some recording engineers, which happened to be Bones Howe, he preferred to work at night. So we would work from seven at night till like three, four, five in the morning, believe it or not. Then we'd have to try to get a little rest. And then we'd go do a play a club like the Cinnamon Cinder in Long Beach or whatever the case may be, or Harvey's Gold Street in Garden Grove. So it was crazy. And we had to get our act together and figure what are we going to do on this tour? What were your impressions of the monkeys individually, if you could? Describe each one of them, your first impressions of each monkey at well, that time. Well, needless to say, uh, Davy Jones was and is, he was a charmer. He, he, Davy had the ability to make you feel like you were the only person in the room when you were with him, which isn't easy because he had millions of fans. And, and also, I think he was just a very good, good person. I could tell you other stories about how he stayed and he loved my mother because he lost his his mother. He called him mum. Mike was more of a, a musician and much more business oriented. He had a purpose and a direction. He knew what he was all about and what his possibilities were. And I think he had written already a uh, different drum for the Stone Ponies with Linda Ronstadt. So it's somewhere around there. So, you know, Mike Mike was doing pretty well. Mickey, of course, as you know, from Circus Boy and things like that, he, you might say he was just a child star hanging out in Hollywood. and But he's a fun guy, a lot of energy, you know, and a good guy. Uh, Peter was, was a bit of um, an intellectual, and he certainly thought he was an intellectual. And I think he tried to make you know that, he was not just a rock and roller, that he was an intellectual, but he was a talented guy, very bright, played banjo, and, uh, you know, but he was never one of my favorites, uh, to say the least. So of the four, who would you say you had the closest rapport with? Oh, uh, Davy Jones. Um, Davy and I were both five foot, maybe, <laughs> five foot three, and back then, uh, probably like 118 pounds, you know, and... Uh, we just seemed to bond. I can't begin to tell you how Davey took me under his wing. He gave me new clothing with the sales tickets still on them, you know, from uh, the boot parlor in Hollywood. And he he just, I don't know, for some reason, him and I, we'd wrestle and we'd fight, you know. And uh, he was just very special. And we stayed friends for from 1966 until his passing, which was leap year February 29th, I forget what year it was now, but I can't begin to tell you how good he was. He was good to my mother. Um, My mother made lasagna and her chicken rosemary and brought it to Davy's house at the Hollywood Hills. He was just a very good person. So tell me about the first time the tour started to get underway. The monkeys were flying in from either Australia or England. I don't really know. We were in L.A., and the first date was in Jacksonville, Florida. We all flew in and met at a hotel. I don't remember the hotel, but it was in Jacksonville, Florida. I do remember it was like 100 degrees and very humid. I do remember that. Um, So, you know, to get to Jacksonville, Florida. So really, honestly, uh, we did rehearse. We must have rehearsed in Hollywood the songs that they were going to do. 
that we backed up the monkeys on. You know, Mickey did the, the James Brown tune. Um, Davey, always the theater performer, you know, he from Broadway. Uh, he did uh, Gonna Build a Mountain, Anthony Newley tune. And uh, Mike played his uh, own guitar, and Peter played the banjo. So, uh, so you guys traveled first class all the way. I mean, what was it like staying in the best hotels and having screaming fans everywhere you went? I mean, what was this experience like? It was crazy. Uh, the you know the plane probably was a capacity of maybe 150, 200 people. So you only had maybe 30, 40 people that were on the tour, and then you had this big plane. So consequently, you could lift up the middle armrests and take a nap, you know. Then there was a rear section, <laughs> and that was the smoking room, if you get what I mean. <laughs> that was, oh, the my God. The room. <laughs> oh, and the funny, you know, it's just, it's just so funny because, you know, you have, a, you have the door to the plane near, the, near where the captain comes in, where, the, you know, the, the flight crew goes, and they go right into the cabin, you know, and, and fly the plane. Then you have the rear door. And the rear door was right next to this tail section, which was like a horseshoe. And so that's where the – and there was a curtain drawn across. But that's where uh, – I seem to recall Turkish water pipes and <laughs> other things. That was the smoking room. And as they opened the door of the plane, out of the rear door, a big puff of marijuana smoke would come out of the plane. <laughs> and, and oddly enough, it was the police department and their motorcycles, the captains, lieutenants. They were excited because their kids loved the monkeys, you know. So it was pretty crazy. The concert, you have to remember, as I said to you, uh, I would say maybe there was fifteen to 18,000 people. I don't really know. But it was a big coliseum. And Jacksonville, it was WAPE was the AM radio station back in the day. I remember that wake. We went to the radio station and Mike Nesbitt was funny. It was like 100 degrees. And so they were invited to be guest DJs. And Mike said, there's a hailstorm coming and it's going to be 15 degrees. <laughs> and people in Florida all, pa all panicked and said, oh, my God, not realizing it was one of the monkeys just, you know, spoofing. And... Um, so I remember it was very hot. And in the stadium, you know, before LED lighting, you had what you had, these 1,000-watt and two and 3,000-watt cans, and there were like 50 of them. So the stadium is like 105 degrees, and on stage it easily had to be 110 degrees. And I remember just being dripping, soaking wet just because of the, the crowd, heat, and then the lighting from all the cans, the lighting cans up above us. It was stifling. You know, and the funny thing about that is that I hadn't met Jimi Hendrix yet. Uh, so we went on and, and I got done and I was sitting on a drum trap case. That's the term trap case. It's a black case where all the hardware is. And I am like dripping wet. And I didn't have long hair. I used to wear a hat. I, I always wanted to be a cowboy. So I had this wonderful hat I bought at Knott's Berry Farm. And, uh, and Jimi Hendrix comes up to me and, and thought I was a roadie. So he thought I was a roadie just backstage sitting on the trap case. And he said, who was that band? And uh, so I just played dumb. I said, that was the band called the Sundowners. And he said, wow, they're very good. I just think Jimmy was impressed with the two lead guitar players in the band being a guitar player. You know, he uh, other good musicians respect other good musicians. It's a mutual respect if you got the chops, you know. So the funny thing is he went on. And I could see that there was going to be, it wasn't, I, I was a little bit surprised. I, frankly, I didn't know a lot about Jimi Hendrix. You know, I come out of Elvis. I come out of Ricky Nelson, uh, even going back to Dwayne Eddy and the Ventures, you know, so. Well, he hadn't really broken out that large at that point yet. No, was this was. after that. Right. Uh, his hit, uh, Purple Haze, did not become a hit till maybe September, October of 67, and this is uh, July of 67. So, you know, in the rock and roll business and Billboard, the difference three months could make in a uh, in a song uh, is a world of difference, you know. So he was not a known commodity. Um, I, I honestly think that the monkeys thought it would give the tour more rock and roll credibility with Jimi Hendrix being on the tour. And then maybe, I can't, I'm just guessing, uh, maybe Jimi Hendrix thought this was a way he could expose his music to a different audience or broaden his audience. 
And it wound up being quite work out as planned, though, did it? No, it was a train wreck. You can imagine the monkeys crowd with I Want to Be Free and Last Train to Clarksville. And Jimmy Kendrix comes out there and he's wearing purple velvet pants and his hair's out to here. And and uh, and and he's going, Foxy Lady. And he's humping the microphone. So poor Jimmy, uh, you know, uh, uh, such a talent. And 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 they were going, we want the monkeys, we want Davy, we want the monkeys. It, I mean, honestly, uh, we actually, uh, our band, we were concerned about being booed because we we didn't have a hit record. We had an album, Captain Nemo, which wasn't even what didn't even get released. We had a single, so we put together a medley of various songs, and then we did three or four original songs when we were done with the medley hoping that by doing a cover of all these songs from Beatles to Dave Clark Five to the to the Association to the Four Tops, we would ingratiate ourselves to the kids so they wouldn't say, we want the monkeys to the Sundowners. And so that we, we, we sort of like, uh, you know, just thought that was the right thing to do as we didn't want that to happen to us. And certainly it worked because we, we wound up getting screams and people liked us and the kids liked us, obviously not the kind of... Uh, reaction that the monkeys got, but still we didn't get booed off the stage and that was, you know, that could be heart wrenching. You say that you love me, you say you love me all of the time, all of the time, and I feel it. All over. Yes, I'm all over. Did this exposure being on the monkeys tour, did it create any career opportunities for you afterwards? Did you get any perks or jobs or uh, connections having been on the tour after it was over? Well, you know, the, the funny thing is uh, to some degree, um, I think it would have had always you, which was a single that they, they decided to release of the sundown has become a hit. It did pretty well on the West coast fair, it didn't do well on the East Coast. Uh, Cousin Brucey was a friend of ours. But back then, the radio stations picked a song they were going to plug that week. And at the time, there was Never My Love. There was all those, uh, you know, love-type mushy songs. They were looking for something harder. And, and we would have been the song that they would have plugged, Always You. We lost out to Give Me a Ticket for an Airplane, you know, that song. And uh, so the tour, I think, would have definitely given us a big boost had we had even a top 10 or top 20 record, I think it would have made a world, a world of difference. But when we didn't get the hit, uh, as I may have mentioned, uh, frankly, it, it, it in, in some ways led to the eventual demise of the Sundowners. Uh, the Monkees were very fortunate in that the tour went very, very well. I think it was a very successful tour. I think some problems came along when the Monkees, you know, you, when you take a tour, you're in a private plane, you win an Emmy for a TV show, you get a little bit of full of yourself. And I guess in this case, you have four Monkees getting full of themselves. Mm. And... Um, and all of a sudden, they wanted to take charge. Mickey wanted to direct. Micah wanted to direct. And what happened was they, um, the second season of The Monkees did not do as well as the first season. And uh, it, got, it got a little too heavy, too messagey. What was your stage sound like? Did you have monitors? Could you hear yourselves? What was the stage sound like? It was, it, frankly, it was a train wreck. Let's talk about the Hollywood Bowl concert. That was a pretty big show for you guys what do you remember about <laughs> tina turner <laughs> well what happened was because of logistics and or economics they were playing in san francisco i think and they couldn't fly tina turner's band down so we were given the job of backing up tina turner now you gotta remember you got two guitars bass and drums Little white boys uh, doing Beatles and harmonies and 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 the Searchers and Jerry and the Pacemakers and Ricky Nelson and Elvis with a little bit of Fats Domino and two guitars, bass and drums, no keyboards, no horns, and we're given the job to back up Tina. So anyway, um, we go in and Tina shows up. She's wearing a do rag. And uh, she said she was cordial at the time, but I could see already she was concerned because she sees two guitars, bass and drums, a couple of amps, a bass amp and, and drums. And that's it. 
And also, we knew nothing about Tina Turner's material. We just It just is what it is. The Sundowners were never a soul band. When we started rehearsing and the fact that we didn't know her tunes, she literally ripped into us, calling us honkies and what the hell's wrong with you guys? <laughs> I mean, but honestly, and, and it, it was just... It, we did the best we could, and we only had one rehearsal. That was it, maybe for three hours to learn um, the five or six or seven songs that they did, and we had no idea. And uh, they didn't, she didn't even bring uh, music or chord changes or anything with her, as I remember. We were just supposed to know them by heart as if as if we were a uh, Ike and Tina and Turner cover band, which we were the furthest thing from, you know. So it was pretty... Luckily, at the Hollywood Bowl, Ike was there, and he wasn't there at the rehearsal. So Ike was there with his guitar, so that helped us a little. But if you were, as far as our job, uh, from one to ten, I maybe a five, maybe a six. But it was it was not something we were proud of. Did she send you a gift afterwards to yeah. show her appreciation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna tell you something. It, it was. Uh, the funny thing about it is that later on when she had What's Love Got to Do With It and then she was in Tommy and this and that and she won a Grammy and she got up there and as I said, she sounded like Lauren Bacall. She go, I want to thank my manager. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank my record label. And I'm saying to myself, what about the bitch that was ripping us a new a-hole? Holy, where'd that girl come from? I mean, where'd she go? It just is. But luckily her success you know, change people. And she, obviously, I don't think she, I think she's a, a better, a wonderful person. I've seen some interviews on CBS Sunday morning and she seems happy. I think she lives in Paris and life is good, you know, and uh, she just, it was just one of those things. It was, a, you must've been sweating it out on stage that night. You know, uh, uh, it was, uh, it was amazing, but the Hollywood bowl is a pretty amazing place. And then of course you have the water pool in the front the band shell, the crowd. It, it was speaking a, of the pool. Speaking yeah. of the pool, didn't Mickey Dolan's? Oh yeah, into the pool? he broke one of the major rules that you're not supposed to do. He did jump in the pool, no doubt about it. You know, and Mickey's Mickey. He, he uh, God bless him. He has a lot of energy and he goes with the flow. He give, he does what he uh, what he thinks he should be doing at that time. Yeah. What would you guys be doing? Would you watch their show every night? Um, yeah, you know, you have, well, we had to be ready because what happened, the monkeys went on after Jimi Hendrix and the Sundowners, and then we backed up Lynn Randell, and she was lovely, a lovely girl from Australia. I love that Australian accent. She was very friendly and very, uh, <laughs> very, very nice. <laughs> um, uh, then we'd have to wait because after the monkeys uh, did their solo show then we came on and then uh, mickey came out and did his song i feel good or whatever the song i think he uh, that did that song and and i got and, a woman i think is the one i got a woman um and maybe he did that yeah that should could have been you're right i got a woman we're close now and so it could be uh so uh, the greatest the hardest working act in, sh in show business he was uh james brown to reincarnate you know and so we had to always be ready to come back on I think, for a matter of fact, you know, we also opened for The Who and Herman's Hermits and the Monkeys in September of that year at the Anaheim Convention Center. Did you have any offstage moments with uh, the experience that you recall? Yeah, uh, well, well, we went on that great boat ride. You know, uh, somebody rented a boat. We were right there in, uh, in Miami. I remember being in the elevator with Jimmy, and they're looking at him, the, <laughs> the little Altacaca ladies, and are you Van Dam? Are you? <laughs> they thought aliens were coming in. <laughs> it was crazy. But anyway, uh, we all went on this boat ride, and and uh, it was pretty funny. Mitch Mitchell, Noel Redding, of course, you know, uh, Noel was a bass player, a very good bass player, and I, him and I being bass players, we talked to each other, and Mitch, the nicest guys, the only thing in, uh, they were like uh, five foot ten and about 100 pounds. I felt like we needed to give them both a Twinkie. What do you remember about how Hendrix exited the tour? What was the moment that he left? Well, um, I was going to say, by the way, on that little boat ride, we wound up doing a doo-wop song. And I think in one of the teen magazines, me, Eddie, and Jimmy are actually doing 
footsteps, like a, in you know choreography to a doo wop song. It might have been my girl. I don't really know, but it was crazy. Um, I do know that New York City and the tours. After a while, the writing was on the wall that and and Jimmy knew it, and so he was pretty bummed. Uh, I sat on the plane with him in Jacksonville, and we talked about bass players. And he was pretty up, and he was very sober, and he was wonderful. And I I told him that I loved uh, I loved Paul McCartney's bass playing because it was so melodic. Uh, so and it was also I loved it because it was being a bass player. The Beatles always put Paul's uh, bass playing up in the mix. You know, if you listen to Day Tripper, or Little Help of My Friends, like uh, Penny Lane, the bass is, is really up in the mix. Even James Brown was one of the few people to bring bass up in the mix and not as a afterthought. So Jimmy and I, and uh, by the way, when he came into the plane, and I was introduced to him. Bobby, this is Bobby Dick of the Sundowns. He said to me, hey, you fucking with my head. Because <laughs> he knew I played him a little bit and punked him a little bit by not admitting that I was in the band. I just wanted to try to find out incognito what he thought of the Sundowners. That's all. <laughs> anyway. What was yeah. his opinion of the Monkees? Did he ever express uh, what he thought of their music or them as people? You know, I, I don't think so. I think Jimmy was trying to sort out plan B. You know, once he realized this wasn't going to work and he had planned on, on being on tour from July till September uh, to Labor Day, uh, now all of a sudden, two weeks into the tour, he's realizing that this is not going to work. Um, I had a, I had I know it was a bad time. I know we were staying at the Warwick Hotel. I remember Dick Clark introducing Jimi Hendrix at Forest Hill Stadium. I don't know if it was the first show or the second show. I think we did two or three shows because New York City is such a big market. I had all my Italian relatives and my relatives from Long Island and Brooklyn and Queens and Flushing. They all came, you know, and uh, and all of a sudden the, the kids were relentless and, and, and they just, we want the monkeys, we want Davey. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think uh, Jimmy flipped the bird uh, to 15,000 people. Yes, the little kids and the parents as well and walked off stage, you know, and Dick Clark had to do some fancy little uh, two-step to try to cover. And uh, what happened was is uh, for the rest of the tour, we were given an additional maybe 20 minutes or 25 minutes uh, to fill uh, Jimmy's leaving the tour. Um, I do remember seeing him at the Warwick Hotel in the lobby. I could tell he was distressed and I knew something was up as he wasn't happy. What was the monkey's reaction to that situation happening? Um, I think they would, you know, they thought it would work and uh, the monkeys had to deal with the fact that they were superstars. And I don't think they, you know, I th I'm sure they were disappointed about it. Uh, we never really spoke about it, to be honest with you. Uh, it was like, it knew it wasn't right. Let's admit it and move on. And of course, you know, we have the rest of, uh, you have a month and a half of tour dates to do. So you have to step up to the plate and just keep on trucking. So all they did was give us that extra sundowners, extra time to do more material to fill the void. And that was it. But I don't really know. I don't really remember discussing it. Were there any uh, close calls or funny things that happened that you recall that stand out from that? those trips that you did all over? Uh, yeah, there was a close call for me. I uh, I was visiting my relatives in Flushing, and the, the next gig was going from Flushing uh, from New York City to Buffalo, and I missed the plane. Davey said, let's turn the plane around and pick Bobby. We got caught up in traffic on the Van Wick or whatever, and and uh, I had to fly out. I stayed overnight, and didn't they didn't turn the plane. They they snuck off, and I flew to Buffalo on my own. And uh, But Davey suggested they turn the plane around to pick you up. That's the kind of that you know, it was on the it was taxiing on the runway. And this is a again, this is not a, a scheduled airliner. This is a turboprop private plane. They and it, it was up to Davy, they would have, but they said, No, we're not gonna do that. And everything was cool, you know, it is what it is. And I made it to the concert the next day. I got into town around twelve or one o'clock and stayed at the Statler Hilton in Buffalo. Uh the only thing I would say is that uh, they were playing there were little games that were going on on the tour. And that was the game was if you had a, a group of people, five, 10, eight people, whatever the group was, 
you all decided that you would slip a Mickey, which would be maybe a tab of white lightning into somebody's drink, but not tell them. <laughs> so everybody else knew who was, who was going to be uh, medically uh, treated, and, uh, but you didn't tell them. So all of a sudden you could, you know, here you are and you're probably token some weed. So you're pretty happy at the time. And all of a sudden you can see this person going, uh, what's going on here? Some pretty crazy stuff. Honestly, that was a thing that was happening for a little bit, as I recall. <laughs> and I, re I, the only reason I recall that is that someone did it to me. I, I remember, I think it was coming back from Seattle or, or, or from Seattle to Spokane. And and I kept on. Um, someone slipped a tab of white lightning into my <laughs> into my whatever I was drinking, and I remember trying to get off the plane at eight thousand feet above sea level. I kept on hallucinating. Welcome to LA International Airport, and I could see everybody laughing. And that was what people did. It was it was it was the joke. You know, it was the running joke, <laughs> and, and something to do in between concerts. <laughs> How did you get involved taking photographs and doing kind of reports and articles for the teen magazines about the tour? Well, you know, you have to remember, uh, here I am on this tour, and I was excited about it. And what do I have? I have a Kodak Instamatic, the one with the flash cube. And, and so the little flash cube in the cartridge, and you had to wet the bulb and put it in. And every time you took a shot, the flash cube would turn around to the next shot. And uh, someone said to me, Bobby, you're on tour with the hottest tour of the summer and you're coming and you're, you're on tour with an Instamatic, Kodak Instamatic. So my brother, Michael, he was always so good to me. My brother, Michael, bought me a Pentax Spotmatic uh, single lens reflex camera. And they said, start, and I started taking pictures. And uh, as a matter of fact, I had, because I was an entertainer, I had an all access pass. And uh, the all access pass meant you could go anywhere, backstage, front stage, anywhere you wanted to go to take pictures. So Ann Moses, you know, from Tiger Beat magazine one time gave me her Nikon. And she said, Bobby, would you do me a favor and take some pictures for me? Because I don't have an all access pass. And uh, of course, I had a little crush on Ann Moses. She was adorable and still is. And uh, and so I took some pictures for her, you know, and just. And, uh, yeah, you think about, well, you're on tour with the monkeys, you know, oddly enough, um, I had the Instamatic with Jimmy and I, I don't even, I hardly have any pictures. I, you know, they were just stupid little pictures. And, and, uh, uh, by the time I got my single lens reflex, uh, a spot at Pentax, uh, Jimmy had quit the tour. But so you did it. take uh, you did take photos and you did some articles, didn't you? Yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody, you know, Lynn Randell on tour with the Monkeys. I think I did one with Tiger with the uh, Sixteen Magazine or Tiger Beat or Teen Screen. I I don't remember. It was called. Uh, and I sold some pictures. I think I sold them for like three, four hundred dollars. You know, and as a matter of fact, they had to pay me in increments of fifty dollars. You know, but it was pretty much uh, anybody that had something to do with the tour did the same thing. Rick Klein, who was the road manager, he might have taken some pictures. Henry Diltz, obviously, but he was he was one of the actual staff photographers, I think. He was on the tour. So we all did those things. You know, they were, uh, you know, big stars, you know, and uh, and so it was just something. So tell me how you kept in touch with Davey over the years. You said you went up to his house after the tour, and I think it was 68, spent yeah. some time with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Davey knew that uh, my mother was Italian from the old country. And he says, well, why, did, why don't you have her? He called my mother mum, because that's what they do in England. They called her mum's mum. And Davey lost his mum at a very young age. So my mother, my sister was visiting from Brooklyn. So she made uh, lasagna and her chicken, roast chicken or chicken. And we went up and Davey was still married to Linda at his time, his first wife. He had a beautiful gated beautiful gated house in the Hollywood Hills. I think it was on Queens way. Why do I remember Queens way in the Hollywood Hills? And, um, and so we, we all made it and he had a beautiful German shepherd in a swimming pool, the most beautiful house overlooking the Valley and some smog, of course, but it was wonderful. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Neil Young, I'm uh, roadies were there. 
there were lots of people there, you know, uh, LA was a place that you had tequila and a lemon wedge and, a, and, a, and joints and, and food and wine and drink and merriment. You know, that was the scene, you know, you're all, you're all in this rock and roll business, whether you're a roadie, an entertainer, a security guard, a musician, you know, whatever, a hairdresser, et cetera. So Any was, other memories of Davey? Well, uh, I have a couple of sad memories of, of the monkeys. You know, the monkeys did a second tour. By that time, the whole thing just crashed and burned. And I remember going to see them in New York City with my wife and my first wife, Joan, at the time. And um, we went to the hotel room and it was like going to a wake. Here it is two years later and the tickets weren't being sold. Concerts were being canceled. The whole thing just blew up and, and crashed and burned. It was very, very, very sad, you know. Did David and talk to you about this happening? We, we all talked about it. And, uh, you know, here we were being self-serving. I was saying, well, why didn't they ask us to go on the second tour? Because we did so well with the first tour. And the problem was the second tour just didn't have the giddy up that the first tour had. And it was apparent that it, that was going to be the case. And um, so it is what it is. Nothing is forever. And uh, but anyway, we did stay in touch with Davy Jones and my and uh, we went to the reunion concert. You know, I think it was 1986 was the monkeys with the grassroots and uh, uh let me see the grassroots and the uh, midnight confessions. Da, da, da. So, and believe it or not, people were laughing, thinking that was the best selling tour of that summer was the monkeys tour. And with the grassroots and the, uh, who was it? Young man, get out of my life. You know, uh, who did <laughs> that? Gary Puckett. Gary, young girl. I, yeah, young, uh, young guy, well, young man. Well, uh, LGBT, I'm just trying to be very politically correct here. <laughs> <laughs> oh god i'm so I sick gary doesn't see this yeah i know he had he had um, a great yeah but that was a great tour so davy davy arranged for tickets and he met us at the bus and and you know what he said he gets off the bus at the at the hotel in saratoga and they were going to play smack you know saratoga farms and he says to my mother hello mom are you going to make me noodles oh it was so cute oh my god so he left us backstage passes we saw the guys and it was like all it was wonderful, you know, like old home week. Only there we were not there as musicians, we were there as and so we went backstage and we later on we met back at the hotel, we went to the hospital. It was just wonderful. It was wonderful. All courtesy of Davey. Yeah, he just he he stayed friends and we've always we'd see each other in Hollywood because I had friends still in LA. One guy's a writer, my good friend George. And so we all met at a hotel. Peter showed up. Uh, we always stayed in touch. It was a wonderful thing. And um, Davey, as a matter of fact, um, called Susan and um, asked her to play a party, the two of us, because I had left the band. And uh, we played a, a party for all the jockeys down in uh, Dover, uh, Delaware, at a race course that he had some horses running. He had horses running in Saratoga in the steeplechase, and we just always stayed. And he loved my mother. And the uh, great story was uh, in August of uh, 2004, I think it was, I forget, he invited my mom. I couldn't go because I was booked. We were booked playing gigs. And uh, my mother and my sister and my brother-in-law went, and Davey stopped a crowd. He had about a crowd of about five, 6,000 people at a concert. And he said, I just want to say hello to Bobby Dick's mother, Tina. Hello, Tina. And, you know, and all the crowd gave a big round of applause. And, and then they invited him to the hospitality suite afterwards. Um, it was wonderful. Um, I did. Uh, it was it was a great thing. I don't want to forget that the, the uh, you know, we should really talk about the plaster casters. Fine. <laughs> which is which is going from my mother to talk about the plaster casters is a is a, an unusual segue. Mom, my mom passed away. The the story about that is he treated my mom great and she died in November of that year. But he was and he called me and spent an hour on the phone with me and the family on speakerphone telling me how much he loved my mom. And it was great. But anyway, so then that was that. And and we just we did stay in touch quite a bit. Yeah. When was the last time you saw him? Um, I saw David at the BB Kings in Broadway. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know if he had been married yet to his uh, latest, uh, little hot, uh, 
had enchilada there. She was adorable, and he was great. People still love him, and uh, you know he uh, in making twenty twenty five thousand dollars a night. You know for a for 40 years later, it is pretty impressive. It just goes to show you how big the monkeys were. Davey still drew a crowd and made everybody feel wonderful when you were around him. What was your last interaction with him? Was it at that show? Yes, at that show. Um, and um, it was funny because he was, he was pressing uh, his own outfit to go on stage. And I'm afraid I forgot the name of his uh, young wife there. Uh, it was uh, Jessica. Je uh, she didn't know how to press clothes. <laughs> she was just a pretty face and a very pretty one. And so uh, Susan and I were kind of laughing a little bit because there's Davey pressing his own shirt to go on stage. It was crazy. And that was the last we saw each other. We talked on the phone a couple of times um, and, he, and he always kept in touch. And uh, I think he, they did this oldie show when he was a part of it in Pittsburgh. And then boom, he passed away after that. So I got to ask you your Elvis story. I loved Elvis. I loved Elvis uh, from the get go. My parents, I remember we talk about Elvis and my, and my father and my aunt Viola, and my aunt Eva, and they're all, they're all saying, Oh my God, I hate this guy. I hate this guy. And my grandmother who was from Hungary, who was the time was probably 70 years old. She said, you leave him alone. He's good to his mother. <laughs> anyway, So, uh, Elvis was amazing, and uh, to, to watch him on Ed Sullivan's show, and actually we watched the first one, which was on Jackie Gleason, Jimmy and Tommy uh, Dorsey's show, which is one of the first places Elvis was on. And uh, I loved Elvis, and, uh, and, and, and so I was a fan uh, in my entire life, you know. And uh, um, Bones Howe, who produced our record, was producing uh, the Elvis special, the 1968 special, uh, the comeback special where he's wearing his black leather outfit. And um, we were talking to Bones Howe, myself, my brother was with me, but he was in the hallway. He was visiting from New York and Bones says, guess who's next door in this office on Sunset Boulevard? And I said, who? He said, your buddy. I said, who? He said, Elvis. And I, I just about flipped and he said, I know you love him and I wish I could bring you in there, but they're having a meeting on how to do the video portion. I'm doing the sound, but uh, Steve Binder's doing the video and uh, I can't bring you in there, I'm sorry. So after our meeting, uh, we left, I'm in the hallway and we push a button to an elevator, my brother and I, Michael, and all of a sudden I hear, hold on there. <laughs> we turn around, it's Elvis, Elvis, gets in the elevator, me, my brother, Elvis, and he goes, hey, how you doing? And I was just, you just don't think this is ever gonna happen. So we talked a little bit, but frankly, I was a babbling idiot. But I did mention to him that I had gotten his father who had remarried. I had arranged for Vernon Presley's children to get tickets to the Monkees concert. And he thanked me for that. But other than that, I wanted to tell Elvis, I didn't, that why is he doing rock a hula baby and spin out and, and those other kind of things? And why isn't he doing MacArthur Park, you know? And I think that I can take it and adjust uh, or the road is wrong. Why isn't he doing that stuff? And I didn't do any of that stuff. I was, I was a basket case and starstruck. And Elvis and, and how did I, the photographs of you guys come to be? Uh, one of Elvis's uh, buddies was going to bring the limousine. Uh, it wasn't a limousine. It was a Lincoln Continental Mark, whatever, um, around. And so while we were waiting, I was talking with Elvis. I said, do you mind if we take some pictures? He said, sure, I don't mind. No big, you know, go. And so my brother took two pictures, three pictures of me with Elvis. And I took one or two pictures with my brother, but mine were a little bit blurry because I was shaking. And, and, uh, and, and, but he was wonderful. And I was yelling to my wife who was across the street with my son. I wanted to bring him over because Elvis would have held my son, Bobby J. And we would have taken a photo because he was very hospitable. He did not in any way seem uppity or unfriendly. He was genuinely, it's just that he, he didn't know what to do with me, like to give me a Valium or what. <laughs> he, 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 he was okay. He said, well, I hope this guy doesn't have a heart attack, but maybe, 
but maybe I'm thinking Elvis is used to that, you know, and, uh, and then he got in the, in the uh, Lincoln Continental and drove off. And then, uh, oddly enough, I had that eight by 10 picture blown up. And then later on, on tour in 73 or 74 in Hampton, Virginia, we, the crowd was so big. They actually ended the show. I was hoping he would sign the picture, but I gave it to a policeman because he was ready. You could hear 2001 Space Odyssey start, so he had to go on. But he saw me, and I saw him, but he, obviously he wouldn't recommend, rec remind me from five, six years ago. But the, El the policeman brought the frame thing over, and Elvis signed the cardboard, the white cardboard frame the picture was in. He didn't say to Bobby. He just said, Elvis Presley, I have it upstairs. And, uh, and, and, and that was an amazing concert. My mother was there, and uh, it was magical. Uh, when you're in Virginia and you hear when he does the tour, the trilogy, glory, glory, hurry, you think Robert E. Lee is coming over the hill, and it was amazing and how well he sang. He sang Bridge Over Troubled Water, and he nailed it. And I was worried for him that he wouldn't hit the note at the end. He nailed it, and I was so happy for him. And my mother, my mother, I tell you, he's a nicer boy. I like a nicer boy. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the plaster casters. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, so we're on the tour now and we're in Chicago. And believe it or not, we're staying at the Astor Towers. I understand, by the way, the Astor Towers now is a condominium complex, but it was a regular hotel. And so we have this hospitality suite. So all of a sudden we're all there and we're maybe they're uh, maybe they're token a little bit. Maybe we're having a sandwich and a drink. And somebody calls up the phone rings in the hospitality suite. And they say uh, the security. Somebody says the security guard downstairs says there's a bunch of girls here, a few girls that say they are the plaster casters, and they have a special fan club, and that they think you'd be interested in. So we we didn't have a. It was after the gig or maybe one of the nights that we had off. So they said, sure, send them up. So anyway, they come up, and it turns out that these girls, who are grandmothers today, by the way, and beyond. Uh, they explain that they make uh, plaster casts of male male genitals. Uh, <laughs> but in the environment, you're all going, hey, whatever, whatever floats your boat, baby, you know. So sure enough, um, I guess uh, what happens is uh, uh, one girl starts dancing around in a little outfit and the other girl starts making up the plaster of Paris. To be honest with you, and I have to be honest, uh, I had my cousin with me who was a, a school teacher, a music teacher, classically paint, uh, trained pianist, and I had her, and we were just visiting. I said, hey, you want to come to the Astor Towers? And So I will tell you that I, when I saw what was going on and what was about to go on and, and the subject matter, I think my cousin Elizabeth and I left. But that's what they, that's, they said, hey, Bobby, what'd you leave for? You missed the best part. Oh, my God. So anyway, it's a bunch of girls that do this. And there were, I guess there were other clubs or chapters. This one was Chicago. There was one in Hollywood maybe one in Vegas, maybe one in Florida. I don't really know. People all were saying to me, oh, Bobby Dick, you're full of crap. There's no such thing that ever happened like that. And then MTV, MTV did a special on the plaster casters. And I think they, I think they interviewed some of the plaster caster ladies who, well, yes. I think Peter Tork wound up being their subject. If oh, I, you know, I, it could be. I I, uh, I don't recognize it per personally. <laughs> and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> well, legend has it that while the girls were trying to prepare Peter for his cast, one of the girls almost split her finger in two. And uh, it was actually Mickey who tourniqueted it, but it stopped the process from happening. It, it could be. Uh, they didn't ask me because it, it was like a, it was like fishing. If it's too small, you have to throw it back in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Our new show is really gaining uh, strength, uh, even though I'm I'm not playing bass because I'm not a good guitar player. I don't want to play guitar and be mediocre. Uh, I'm playing, I'm singing to tracks, and I'm creating tracks using GarageBand. Our show could be everything from Phantom of the Opera to Radio Gaga by Queen. 
our show can be Billy Joel to the Foo Fighters. And I love the challenge of still hitting the high notes. Uh, my wife and my now my wife is singing Susan, and she's singing. She's adding harmonies. And like Saturday, I'm doing a high school graduation party, and uh, it's a you know I, I think it's it's an honor and and an ego trip for me because here I am. I I'm older than their parents and I'm around their grandfather's age, but the kids know that we and me are the real deal. We are not phonies. Yeah, we're doing cover songs but we're nailing cover songs and we're doing them the way they should be done. And they just love it. And of course, being that my wife is a DJ too, there is that whole DJ element that you play, you know, uh, uh, whether it's McNamore uh, or whatever else well, I'm doing this for a living. I don't have day, a day job, you know? So when you don't have a day job, one minute you're doing a, a senior citizen, 65 plus community, the next day you're doing a graduation party. If you look at the playlists of both, it's going to be pretty deserved. But it's a it, it's a wonderful thing that I can do it. Well, that's the uh, that's the spirit and uh, dedication of a true musician, which you are. Thank you so much, Bobby, for sharing your stories about the monkeys with me and talking to me about your experience in the music business. I really appreciate you coming by, and best of luck with your show. You're continuing on in your sixties now. I thank you very much, and I and and and, and as I said, Joe, I, I really respect the uh, the uh, the research that you've done and your knowledge. You're much younger than I am, but the fact that you know all these details and the nuances is is refreshing. And I hope people realize that it's not as easy as it looks. They just look at the stage and the lights and the people cheering. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into being a musician, not just rock and roll. I, don't, I mean, they, it, there's a lot of work. I love what I do. And, and the fact that people keep calling uh, is, a, is, is a magical thing. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here.